Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Deep Thoughts on this sort of cool Monday evening. So, um, you know, I've been making these episodes based on um, ancient, lost technology, building technology. And what's funny is I just scratched the surface. I thought I had done a fairly deep dive and I have found so many other channels that are just breathtaking i mean one our episodes there's a place called uncharted x.com or uncharted x probably.com too guy does the most thorough episodes on whatever he's talking about but i've been just bouncing around looking at different videos but today i was driving my car and you know how those of us like you and i we try to make sense of things. What really is the linchpin of our existence is when we find something that doesn't make sense. You just get that feeling. You don't have the answer necessarily, but you're kind of like you're putting yourself in the shoes of others. And you're kind of like, you try to be Shakespeare writing Iago and Othello. You know, it's like, he's the notorious bad guy of Shakespeare's entire catalog. And what you learn when you study Shakespeare, especially through acting, is that if you had to play Iago, the biggest mistake you could make is playing him as a bad guy in your mind. I'm a bad guy. I'm a bad guy. I'm doing bad things. You would get it wrong. And I forgot which actor was asked this. I learned this in acting class. But they asked this actor, who I guess routinely played bad guys in Broadway and maybe even some motion pictures. And he said, what's it like to play bad guys all the time? And he said, I don't play bad guys. I play guys. You just perceive them as bad. What he was teaching the person who's asking the question was that a bad person seldom ever sees themselves as a bad person. Now, we know there's exceptions to the rule. There are weirdos that just, you know, they set out to do bad things. But even in their most heinous act, I think that, that even though they might set out to do something bad, before they commit the act, it goes right in their brain. And they're doing something that they maybe don't even have a moral compass on. They're just going, I like this, I like this, I like this, I want this, I want this, and something bad happens. And then maybe afterwards, they immediately regret it. But when you look at the world in any sort of, mm, I'm going to say superficial context that man generates around things to understand things, spiritual contexts, contexts that have some sort of upper meaning beyond just being here, you know, just a total atheist view of the universe, and it starts to not make sense on some levels. Well, lots of levels, of course. Not sure how an atheist mind works. I have an envy for anyone that is not full of hate, but is also an atheist, because there's been several incredible atheists in the world that seem just to go to one conference at another and just hate-filled speeches about everyone else who wasn't like them. And I think that's sad, because how much could one really contribute to their own mind slash society in written form or spoken form if they are sitting in a realm of of sort of a, a blockade of hatred. Because you have to get past that to see this enlightened world that's out there. Now some of you, a lot of us, more describing ourselves as spiritual, which leaves a little bit of ambiguity and abstraction to the fact that we don't know why we believe in something, why we think something is a particular way. And so we don't know, but we feel it. We feel some sort of spiritual connection to the universe. You know, we also have very romantic concepts like God. There's even a romantic concept in the devil as it applies to God. How does God become a hero to us? 
Well, if there were no devil or demons, then God would sort of be a benign being and we wouldn't have much of a choice or challenge to be any other way, but I guess perfect. Because without the ability to choose something that would be perceived as a sin slash negative slash wrong, what would we be? But perfect. I was driving home and I was thinking, how come the world is so screwed up? I mean, we know people who are doing these things. We know them by name. They wear crowns. They own gigantic mansions in Europe and America and around the world. People selling out people for a little bit of short-term gain, maybe in a lot of cases for the older families, a lifetime of perceived gain, although they have to live in the neurosis and the narcissism and the fear that we're going to come take it away. So they want to get rid of us. So there's just a little bit more peace when they grow up. But imagine, just for a split second to digress into that thought. You're a Rothschild. You're a Windsor. You're a Habsburg. You're something big. Something giganticly powerful. And you've been in power for thousands of years. And you think to yourself, gosh, if we could just get rid of most of humanity, this Agenda 21 thing. 99% 99% of the universe is, or the, sorry, universe, our universe, Earth, is gone. But we're going to keep around some people because we don't want to do any work because that's the lazy kind of people that we are. So we need some people to take care of our lawns, wash our clothing, fix our food. You would have to almost strategically pick the most meek human beings on Earth and probably starve them down to the point where they would almost die if you didn't allow them to have a little food pellet. Because if you kept around strong people to build new buildings, to build new things, someone with seriously just basic upper body strength, at any point in time, without a shock collar, without some super technical barrier, between you and them, of which the power supply is absolutely inaccessible to them, and then you would have to maintain all the expertise to maintain the machine, to keep them at bay, just like a pet. They could easily rise up and take a hammer or a big stick and come into your house and clobber you over the head until you're dead. And then the meek would quite literally inherit the earth. Or would they be meek at all? The equation never works out, is my point. Then we look at the world, and it's screwed up. And for a lot of us, we want to believe that there's a higher being, a God, to make it easy on our minds that have a big, big problem with infinity. We go with one God. Boy, is that convenient. It feels good, right? It does. I will tell you that it makes me feel more comfortable. There's one being in charge way up there. And you might have to go through layers to get to that God, maybe other alien races and that kind of thing. But eventually there's one God in total control of all things. And God has a threshold of what God will allow to happen in any corner of the universe. And then you hear about human trafficking, you hear about Epstein's Island and you realize, well, that's not true. It's simply not true. Children, the most innocent beings on this earth, are being liquidated to feed a whole culture of celebrities, of royalty, of bankers, so they can be a little younger. And so they can get high. Quite literally, using the lifeblood of a child. Doesn't sound like God is... uh, intervening much based on any moral code that might have been handed down on two tablets off of of a mountain. It was almost as if that was invented for suckers. You are these evil, greedy, mentally ill elite. At least what we call the elite. Or the ruling class. And they're like, how could we get them to dumb themselves down such that we are untouchable in their minds They behave, we don't. In fact, they behave so much, and we understand the human consciousness so much that if we can get them to be as good-spirited as possible towards each other, 
They can't even conceive of the evil that we do because the evil things that we do do not fit in the consciousness of a good person. Hmm. Most of us feel like we have some sort of spiritual interior. We feel it. We do. So how do we sort this thing out? We've got visions of people who are dead, walking on earth, telling us things that only they would know. So we've had supernatural experiences. So there's proof that we have spirits that were alive at one point, in the flesh at least, in a flesh suit. Their being of light has escaped due to their mortal coil passing away. And now they can go wherever they want. Perhaps. We know some people remain on earth. Some people probably remain on earth out of pure choice. We have all kinds of tales from different cultures that say that if you're a bad person, you can't escape earth until you find a way to get reborn and redeem your soul to the universe such that you almost gain the upper maturity to be with more pure, good-hearted souls. But what if it's uh, pretty much the same way it is down here at the next level? And maybe there's several levels. Hard to think you would need infinite levels, even if we want to come to the defense of our own mortality and conceiving things. But what if God is one being who's very, very powerful and perhaps indeed responsible for creating our little corner of the universe, perhaps our entire universe. But the problem is, just like we experience down here on Earth, as we are made in His own image, right? God is fighting a battle of His own. Maybe. We talk about the devil. Most of us can feel the devil. And it's not necessarily a Christian devil by any means. It's just a convenient word to call something that is living for the opposite objectives that we live for. Not quite the absolute Cthulhu who was trying to, by way of which H.P. Lovecraft or whatever it was, who romanticized the character, where that character is essentially undoing all existence, meaning when it's done, nothing exists, which negates its own existence. Therefore, probably a silly little circular logic problem to make an interesting bad guy. But what if God is fighting a war of his own? What if we are the results of a few lost rounds? And God can only do so much. Perhaps God does have limits. Now, a lot of us romanticize our own suffering into the realm of this is what we are supposed to be doing. For some reason, my grandparents, one generation of my grandparents, were able to skip the depression even though technically they grew up during the Depression, they weren't old enough to feel the utter PTSD that my older grandparents felt. But they got the roaring 40s after the war. They got the beautiful 50s. Yes, there was Korean War and nuclear threats. They lived through Vietnam, but they were too old to go into the war, both my grandparents. One of my grandfathers was in World War II. Then the 70s, which cleaned up really nicely. The unbelievable 80s. And then for them, even though 90s had a lot of negativity, they never listened to gangster rap. They never listened to grunge. So they never got into the destruction of the American culture. Perhaps the world culture. But I don't live anywhere else, so I can't vouch for any of you who live in different countries. By the 2000s, they were in their sunset years, passing away before 2010. So they got, for the pound-for-pound payback of investing in life and following rules, they got the American dream. Retirement. One of my grandmothers never had to work, although she kind of did, but she didn't have to. And all the other three grandparents I had worked. But we want to say that God is around us. And depending on what generation you're born into is how you perceive religion in the first place. For instance, my grandparents, all four of them, never spoke of any end times. The world was not going to end. Revelations was just a book. But today, my friends who are in their 60s, 
because they got to experience the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And for the last three decades after that, they're having you know, their heart pulled out because their country is being destroyed. And yet most of them, uh, well, at least some of them, sadly worship their own demise, thinking that what is negative is positive and what is positive is negative. They are constantly mentioning end times. End times represents something very comforting for someone that can't change the negative features of their own perception. Because God will be coming down, all the angels, Jesus, and he's going to clean up the whole planet. It's an effortless way to deal with negativity. Because they don't have to do anything to fix anything. They just merely need to exist day to day. If God takes them before the second coming, well then that's that's a clean exit. But if God comes down and cuts their life short, potentially, the way it was going, and then they believe that they have given their soul to Jesus and they will go to heaven, so it's clean. It's a perfect way to believe if you are suffering from today's slings and arrows. But let's take our world and reduce it perhaps down to a few corporations so we can understand it a little bit better. Instead of countries, it's corporations. And let's just say you're in Washington State of America, upper leftmost state in this country. There's a bunch of big corporations up there. There's Microsoft up there. There's Google up there. There's some Apple up there, all putting their data centers up there. Oregon has some as well. But they start going at each other and they start disrupting each other. Maybe they send people over to physically sabotage power supplies and air conditioning systems. Maybe they poach each other's employees. Maybe they steal technology from each other. And let's just say some of those companies are good and some of them are bad. So you know, or you perceive, one to be good and one to be bad. Hey, this company started first. They invented this technology. And this company stole that technology from them. And the world didn't seem to care. Oh my gosh. If that was a lawnmower in, in your shed or your garage, well, you'd be very upset that someone came and stole your stuff and didn't pay for it and then told the neighbors that you gave it to them. Or that they didn't steal it in the first place and that that's their lawnmower. Hmm. Well, we are on this planet. We don't know if there's anything outside this planet. We assume so, depending on your beliefs. I have friends that don't believe in aliens at all. They're Christian. They believe the second coming is right around the corner. And almost every generation that's ever dealt with an apocalyptic time in humanity, and we're not there yet, or certainly headed there in a handbasket if we don't start making changes. We see a battle on earth right now. Now, if giving up all of your rights as a human being, as defined by common law, is a negative thing. You should have the right to free speech. You should have the right to your own sovereignty, meaning your life should not be capable of being taken arbitrarily. You follow laws that are based on common law. Do no harm to others. Pretty simple thing. What you do in your privacy, your own home, is your thing. You can't bring everything from inside your home outside and expect everyone to perceive it as do no harm. Because we have do no harm in the physical form, and we have do no harm in the psychological form, which will then result in a deep spiritual issue, most likely, like a PTSD situation. We have the perception and the overall claim that we are all made equal, but we certainly don't seem to practice that in any level. And that has nothing to do with your IQ, your race, or anything. We allow people to tell us to go to war, and we shovel our children into these wars, and they often don't come back. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters, they disappear into senseless wars. Hmm, doesn't seem very godly, does it? So it seems like there's a battle going on. It seems like, if you want to make sense of it, and I know that there's a lot of perceptions that we cannot hold within our mind a single thought of God, and I would agree. 
but that doesn't negate the overall basic truths of the universe. Did Jesus teach us anything that was hard to understand? No, but wasn't that supposed to be the divine word of God? Even if Jesus didn't exist, those words exist on paper, and they seem pretty clear and pretty easy to believe and follow. Hmm. What if God is in a war of his own with his devil character? Well, there could be two methodologies that one could frame this easily. There's probably more. But God is over the devil, and he's simply allowing this to happen because of some grand plan. We must suffer as beings, and bizarrely, we must suffer within generational pockets. My grandparents didn't suffer exactly like I did. One of my grandparents, my father's side, the older side, suffered through the Depression, which must have been horrendous to experience. The other generation did have psychological things going on, but they never went to the Korean War, Vietnam War. They enjoyed the 70s and they enjoyed the 80s. Were unbothered by the 90s and the 21st century. So overall, they lived a pretty darn good life. But their grandkids and their children were victims of economic change to enslave the woman into the man's realm and replacing in her mind the idea that being a mother was the worst job you could possibly ever have and being a mother was demeaning. And today, as we know, even Black Lives Matter groups are now preaching that the nuclear family should be destroyed. A chapter right out of Huxley's Brave New World, which, when released, I believe, in 1938, was kind of considered a horror book of reality. The children would be strung out on drugs, and sex would just be everywhere. So God creates the devil and allows him to go absolutely crazy. And disproportionately so, for some odd reason. But now let's uh, let's break the mold, because this second example, the second paradigm of that war, is never communicated in my circles ever. I've never read it. And it goes something like this: the devil and God are brothers. They're equal. One is not more powerful than the other, but one can cancel the other. And they're at war. Which is why we lose rounds and we win rounds. Equally brilliant in their positive and negative alignment. The devil can always outsmart God and the God can always outsmart the devil. Their tic-tac-toe games are just draws. Their chess games are draws. One never wins, but we're down here like characters in Clash of Titans with the Greek gods are above us, just moving us around, having fun at our expense, celebrating in the times when they win their side. Think about it. In the last, say, 30 years of American history, the bad guy has been winning every single round. Right? Our culture is being turned upside down. Mental illness on this planet has never been more prevalent in any recorded moment that I've ever read in history. We have mentally ill people, probably one out of three. And not just basically mentally ill, but absolutely amazingly ill in the mind. And able to look in a mirror and perceive who they are. Because they've been watching too much TV. They've been trying to get on the winning team. Even if that team says they were to sacrifice all the beautiful things that they would have experienced had they not joined the team. But they're so terrified and programmed that they're the disenfranchised. That they join anyway. A bad decision. Ask most of the kids that got out of the big gangs in the world. And he said, man, that was, uh, that was not a good idea. I mean, some things I would keep because it built me up as a man or as a woman or whatever. But overall, they've done things that they regret. But there's a non-religious version of this story, which erases God 
and erases the devil, at least in any meaningful form, because a God that would allow the suffering that we see on earth is sort of an obsolete God, right? Well, so what you exist. If, if we, this is what's interesting, this is what's really fascinating and something we don't talk about much. If you were to turn earth into a metaphor of your family, and for some reason, you live a long time, you live three times normal, you're guaranteed to make it to the year 300 if you don't get hit by a bus. And instead of having one or two children, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of children and grandchildren, etc. If you were to treat and this is a Christian-based or even a religious-based world, but definitely a Christian-based uh, story. If you were to let your children suffer the slings and arrows that you suffer at the hands of God, you would worry that your soul would never make it through the eye of the needle. You would not be in the book of Peter. You would not make it into the gates of heaven because you would have allowed the suffering knowingly allowed the suffering of your own kids. You would allow them to be consumed in rituals, to suffer at the infancy of total pure innocence. You would allow one of your other kids to grab that kid on an altar and murder them for some pleasure, murder them for a little bit of biological matter that might reduce their aging. You would have allowed that to occur. What kind of person would you be? At the end of that life, you could have stopped it, but you didn't. You may lean on the philosophy that, oh, I couldn't interrupt my child's life. I must let them live their own life. But you allowed common law to be broken when you could have easily stopped it. You're not going to stop everything. Someone's going to stub their toe. You're going to allow that to happen. They're going to drive their car too fast. You're not going to stop them. But straight out vicious evil acts are very apparent on this planet. And there's a person or being in a religious realm that's responsible for it. 100%. Interesting, right? God starts to look a little bit different in your eyes, doesn't he? But there's a whole group of people who are doing research who believe that up from us is not a God necessarily. They're God's plural, and they are what we call, in common culture today, aliens. Aliens, perhaps, that we were spliced from. Aliens, perhaps, we are direct descendants of. And therefore, the game above us is very similar to the game that we're living. It's a competition to see who can win. No one seems to be stopping the evil. Although some people are talking about attempting to do so. And perhaps we're on the brink of a wonderful era where the humanity wakes up and there's more signs of people waking up now than ever before. Just got another call today and a friend of mine's wife is so bloody awake. It's absolutely amazing. I listened to her on the phone. I talked to her on the phone, speakerphone. And by God, she sounds like the most vicious Anon right now of any of the nuns I've ever heard. And she's really a brilliant woman to begin with. So she's using her powers for good. And she's researching like 10 hour days, like all of us do when we wake up, because it's mind blowing that all the evidence of all the wrongdoings slash defined by common law violations is so easy to find, but it's never being reported in the fake news. It's never being ingested or observed by those that are constantly on the other side of the coin. Those who have sold their souls to pure and unadulterated destruction of humanity, of the spirit, and aka of the world. The one thing that is interesting about these ideas of saying, okay, man is suffering crazy. If you live in a first world country, then you would have to do research to find not only the pain and suffering within your own region, region, which you probably have your own examples of, but if you were to set a bar and say, this bar is the maximum suffering that I am aware of, and it could be some pretty vicious things. Uh, again, I'm not even sure that death 
is the most vicious thing that can occur. I think an entire lifetime of suffering dwarfs someone who's allowed to escape back into their light form. And hopefully where we go is where all the people who have had near death experiences say we go, which is a beautiful place with no pain, the place they wanted to stay, even though they were told to come back down. And again, we're, we're thousands of people who've talked about this. But you look at the people in South America who are suffering due to the banking systems of Europe, destroying them. And of course, there's plenty of evil people down there to sell out their own people. What's really strange, and I was in a conversation with a friend of mine yesterday. We we're talking about the Mexican federales. If you're not familiar with these, this is the police force that basically polices Mexico. When I first moved to California in 1987, I immediately started hearing about the corrupt federales. The corruption is not the worst in the world that I've heard. There's other drug cartel elements down there that do the beheadings and those sorts of things. But I have a friend of mine that goes down to Mexico routinely. And every time he goes down there, virtually, he gets stopped by the federales and he's got to bribe them with money, typically, or other items to get them to let him go. And he's not doing anything. Never has. He's not a criminal by any means. I don't think he's ever done anything illegitimate in his life uh, that, that what they would be upset with. But it's supposed to be a Christian-based country, right? Catholicism, for one, is one of the predominant churches in South America. And they're very strict about it. They all have children that when they hit a certain age, they have certain ceremonies to have a rite of passage for the girl, rite of passage for the boy. They go to churches where they go to confession. They give money. They wear crosses are on their chests. They have crosses on their walls at home. But there's not a single federal rally that by the standards of God would ever be allowed in heaven unless he's that one guy or girl who never crossed the line. And I've never heard of one. It's interesting. MS-13, who comes out of San Salvador and all the drug cartel folks, well, do they not have religion? When they paint their bodies with all of their tattoos, they have crosses typically on their bodies. But they will commit the worst crimes that their people do. How does that work? Hmm. At some point, being evil looks like something else. Like the actor said, they don't believe that what they're doing is evil, I guess. Or, out of perhaps a cowardice to make people uh, fear them to counteract their own fear inside themselves. They engage in these activities to feel like they have control. No one can hurt me because I can hurt other people and I prove it every day by doing what I do. Venezuela, which over the years has been known as a romantic country, with amazing culture, amazing, amazing architecture. Well, teenage girls are getting destroyed by six packs every single day. It's horrific. How has that occurred? In Africa, well, they're very aware that Europe and China and all, these, all of our countries are going in there to rape the land. They buy the land. They steal the minerals. They steal the, the gold. You know, when they mine gold in South Africa, nobody even knows where the gold goes. As soon as it leaves the factory, there's no paperwork to say where it goes. It's all being taken somewhere being raped. Diamonds just float like sand particles on some of the beaches in Africa. They protect those beaches to make sure the diamond market for the modern cultures don't lose their value. So the, the power structure behind buying precious stones doesn't get interrupted. The countries seem to be led by folks that some for a moment will care about their people and try to protect their people and others are sort of promoted warlords who are now presidents because they took their militia, knocked out the original government that was for the people, and now they're taking bribes from countries in Europe, maybe even America, to treat their people bad, to create moments of genocide. Who is running the planet? Hmm. Is it strictly a situation where we evolutionarily get stupider as time goes on? Well, that doesn't seem to make any sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. 
unless the aperture of knowledge is absolutely cut off by those who have the means to do so. It's not me, and it's not you. It's all built out of, potentially, for human beings, fear. Fear that a particular group, if allowed to become intelligent, would get angry at how they've been treated, and they want retribution, and they have the physical capabilities, as long as they got the weapons that matched our weapons, to come get that retribution. And so because a very tiny, minute group of world population that we continue to allow to tell us to go to war, to tell us that we hate each other. They have created a bad name for you and me with other cultures. It doesn't even matter what race you are on planet Earth. You could be watching this video in Uganda, and you know that somewhere in your region, there's a country next door that thinks that you're a bad person because it's something that happened that was before you were even born. Hmm. Doesn't seem very godlike, does it? Doesn't even seem remotely in the theme of godlikeness, right? We like to believe that the world has a purpose, that we're here to refine our souls, come in and out forever. And maybe that's simply the game. There is no God. We are all God. We're all the same life force coming down like tentacles. And every time we touch this dimension, there spawns our soul. But we really have a link back, like a root, back to the central trunk of the tree, the tree of life. We have our souls in other dimensions go out the other side of the tree. Who knows? So maybe it doesn't even matter what we do when we're here. But it seems like it's beautiful when man creates things, isn't it? When someone creates an amazing song, a piece of art, or can spiritually enlighten someone else, pass some knowledge on so a little kid can create robots, a rocket, something cool. Now, the alien theory is interesting because all of a sudden, when you go to an alien level of overlords over us, still, it erases the need for a god because a god is supposed to impose some standards by which we are supposed to follow, and so is God. We're not supposed to sin. We're not supposed to hurt each other. So a god shouldn't make a world where this can all happen. And there's a lot of folks that use that as their mechanism to not believe in a god. And I completely understand it, especially the older that I get. At least the traditional definition. But we've heard, you know, romantic story after romantic story about alien races, from reptilian to mantis to, um, I guess the greys are also called sort of reptilian mindset, right? But we also have the David Icke super duper look like stack dudes, the guy that fought Captain Kirk. We hear about the Archons, the Anunnakis, the Raelians. There's a huge list. Any guy who ever made up a story about an alien, well, unless you can prove that guy to be lying, unless he confesses to lie, which all he has to do is not confess to lying. And then you have to keep that in the, in the glossary of alien possibility. Again, the, the guy that was in the original Project Disclosure was Stephen Greer, where he caved during the press conference when asked, what do these aliens look like? I believe the number he came up was like 27. Okay, let's just go with that. 27 different alien races. Oh my gosh, a completely different alien race. We're talking about, not like us, where we're worried about whether you have melatonin in your blood to be uh, fully developed, as Nick Cannon said. We are completely different in species from these other beings. Unless, perhaps... In a dominant gene sequence situation, they do drop a little bit of their blood inside of humanity and they say no matter where this blood goes, there's always going to be a firstborn if the firstborn happens, let's just say, and because they're going to want to do the firstborn because it's all programmed in, they're going to have more intelligence, more sensibility to stay alive. And so we're always going to keep masters of the universe on earth that are direct copies of ourselves, perhaps a little shorter or whatever, because maybe they were like 30 feet tall, maybe they lived tens of thousands of years, we still have a, a normal adjustment. Our visual cortex is cut down so we can't see anything beyond what we see. 
But when you were to have, and we've seen Star Trek, right? Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek, especially in the 90s, from 87 to 2005, they incubated so many scenarios through all those different shows, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Star and Enterprise, excuse me. They have shown us a million different ways that an episode of encountering races or such species would interact. Now, of course, on that show, uh, having to deal with human actors to realize the show, it wasn't really until Enterprise where they had some CG at their hands that they could actually create completely different beings. Before that, they did do it, but it was pretty rare because it required a a very bizarre prop slash costume around a being that would um, interfere with being able to communicate, start sounding like someone talking in a mask. They did it a few times. But they had reptilians, Cardassians, pretty strange looking guys. But we can see how the priorities of different races would struggle just by sheer imperfectness with each other and their goals. But what would their goals be? There were a lot of writings in the past from Greek philosophers to um, Babylonian writers talking about races coming down like the Anunnaki and, and enslaving mankind to dig gold. That's actually in their stories. Dig gold, to dig gold. When if you had any interstellar travel, like I always say on this show, you could make gold with fusion. It'd be no problem. If you had an antimatter engine or any type of infinite energy supply, which obviously they would have to get here, even if they're interdimensional, they could just make gold. And what the hell are you going to do with it all, right? So some of those stories are very man-made. But the other interesting thing is that we don't see God. We don't see the devil. And I mean like in angel form, in demon form. We don't. We, we definitely know people we think have been possessed, that's for sure. And we definitely know people we think have been angels in our lives, right? Whether they know it or not. But we don't see aliens. We think we see UFOs. Some of us think we've had experience with aliens. But they're not here on a daily basis. They're not saying, dude, what's up? You want to join our team? Well, what's your team about? Well, we're all about knowledge and wisdom and expansion and ascension and creativity if you come to our planet, none of this crap exists. There's none of these jerks running the planet. We don't hurt children. So if you want to pick up your stuff and go, let's do it. And then we'd all get on a ship and get out of here. Then they'd probably eat us on the other side. But you know what I'm saying. We don't have any options. This is all sort of a fictional construct in our minds based on things we do see. In order to create a paradigm for us to coexist in pure insanity. The trouble with insanity is that we as human beings looking at other insane human beings, some of them have mutilated their bodies to the point where they're never going to get it back to normal, ever. Some of them are just mentally insane. We hope, this is a, a very sophisticated hope statement, that they're only on a particular drug that if we could get them off the drug and get them rehabilitated, that they would return back to whoever they were. And we would have the option of offering them the ability to be educated however they wish, such that they become a productive member of society. But I don't think anyone's holding their breath, right? And that's a bummer. We have crazy old people like George Soros, who is literally crazy man. He is. And he is the snake eating its tail. He's at the precipice of genius and crazy man. He's got, what, 180 corporations? He's just put in $220 million into this um, program to alter the election of the United States of America, which is an international felony anywhere in the world. You're not allowed to meddle with other people's elections. But he's overtly said it at various conferences, and no one seems to stop him. So who's running this planet? Why wouldn't someone stop him? I mean, it's, a, it's like saying, I'm going to kill all the children in the world. In the middle of a statement, 
to the EU or some G20 or something. Really? I tend to think that that should make people, one, know what kind of person he is, but two, want to stop him at all costs. But not even a retired Navy SEAL or a retired Delta Force squad is going after these people. It's as if we're all sitting here going, well, I was told to follow orders, and if I don't get orders to protect my own universe in a common law manner, then I guess I'll just let it do whatever it's going to do. Maybe if we recycle, if we are truly reincarnated, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you can just do whatever the hell you want. Society seems to disagree with that. Even if you did recycle, you leave people alone in this world. You don't tell people to do things at all, except don't harm you. But even defining what harm is today is a gray area. Science is ignored, while pseudoscience and pop science is becoming official methodology in the universe. I was telling my friend the other day, because, uh, you know, Rick Gervais made uh, the movie about lying. He was in a world where no one understood a lie, and he was the first person to invent a lie. And he was having a blast running around lying to people. And he was getting money out of banks. He was potentially sleeping with women just because he said that he had a medical condition and that this woman had to sleep with him to help him out. It was a brilliant movie. The Invention of a Lie. And it's interesting that we as human beings allow a lot of evil to spread all over the world because we aren't willing to consider for a second the information that we were given was a lie to begin with because it was so romanticized when it was given to us. And then those lies get embedded into flying quote science. When I looked at the first Sumerian tablets in mud, defining their day-to-day lives. And, you know, some of these tablets have transactions of a merchant to a citizen. It talks about how to rotate crops and a bunch of other empirical information about how to live in a society. It talks about all kinds of wild stories and tales. You start to think, well, how, do, how would we know these tablets weren't made recently? It's just mud. Oh, sure. If you made them yesterday, you would know. But what if you made them 50 years ago and you dug them up 50 years later? And you simulated the wear and tear in an exponential manner to make them look like the other ones that maybe you did find, which just basically said, today was my birthday. The Dead Sea Scrolls are so conveniently dug up to stabilize a religion. Never questioned for authenticity. Written by man way after the fact. The people will lean on those scrolls as absolute proof of a story. Proof. Dug up in 1947. Okay. So you write them about 1900, you leave them in some jars that you found somewhere else, you age them. Do you realize that right now in the the world today, there are experts who evaluate fake artifacts all day long? Fake busts of Augusta and Caesar, all kinds of just pieces of art. And the experts sometimes can see it really, really quickly. Oh, that's definitely a fake. The hair doesn't do that in the, in the old days. You can't do this without modern tools. And then sometimes a forgery is so good that it might take one of these experts who's been at it for 20 years, five years to a decade to finally uncover with an equipment that wasn't around five and 10 years ago to to x-ray it from the inside and find out, oh my gosh, it's just as uh, made in China on the inside. We now know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that there was a culture before the one that we are today. With very sophisticated tools. 
they've hatched this idea that there was a cataclysmic event. And I finally cracked that. I cracked that yesterday night. There was no cataclysmic event that ended those individuals' lives for sure, unless there's been tremendous global meddling, which is inconceivable given how many artifacts of monolithic or megalithic construction using superior technology to anything we have on Earth today. And here's the way you crack it. Let's say that you and I are building something pretty, pretty cool with the best technology that we have. And there's a cataclysm, a Pompeii. Um, well, our stuff would be, we, we would be eliminated. Let's say this super, you know, solar wave thing comes at us, the galactic super wave, which is rubbish. Trust me. But we are just literally evaporated. Boom. Just like a, the x-ray gun from a Mars attack, right? We cease to exist. Well, okay, now, what would the world look like in our little circle of life? Let's say there's a, a dozen of us working on something. Not only would whatever we're working on be frozen in time like an obelisk lying on the ground, but all the tools that we use would be also there. All of them. And there would probably be, in a modern society, we wouldn't have invented the tools 100% to such that the rest of our fellow citizens didn't have them as well. Imagine a screwdriver. Wasn't something that a post-cataclysm society could even conceive of. Are you telling me that in a flash of a moment, a cataclysmic moment when all the megafauna are frozen in time with their bellies full of their last meal, that they that we could that the the establishment trying to erase our existence would keep whatever we were building, but they could find every screwdriver on Earth before anyone else found it. Forever, we're talking about. Think about current culture. Where do you keep screwdrivers? Oh my God! Even if you said, well, they're generally in all the homes, but there's some hardware stores, and some of them are stuck in old Plymouths out in the middle of fields and. You'd never be able to find them all. Like the photograph that kicked off the first episode of Westworld. You can't find everything that reveals something. And we haven't found anything that talks about the mathematics, talks about the origins of these people. I mean, if you're willing to take at face value, say like the book of Ezekiel, you, know, you could infer that we definitely had some interstellar visitors. And that's great. You've only further proven that they existed and somehow even they said, okay, make sure you pick up all this stuff. We don't leave anything behind. You know, it's the first contact prime directive thing. Hmm. If you had Star Trek and if the construction sites were small and very focused, only the Giza Plateau, only those three pyramids, I would say you could probably clean up your mess. But they're everywhere. They're everywhere. We're still finding things buried in the ground, chambers. You know, if you were to take Egypt and say everything that was discovered pre-dynastic had a percentage against everything that we think is still buried in the ground, I think you would have the tip of the iceberg. I don't know what the percentage would be, but I would say it'd be barely in the double digits with the rest of it being buried in the uh, desert. That's what the indications are. They allow you to go three levels deep or no, four levels deep under the Giza Plateau, but then they tell you there's 10 other levels. Well, that's 14. So divide four by 14. That's your percentage. Move the decimal over for the actual percentage readout. Okay. The overwhelming majority is still underground. For me, what I'm seeing in this world, and when contrasting that with the fanciful stories by the way, I get that word from Sid Mead. He always liked to use that word. The fanciful stories of a God. Of a place like heaven. What starts to happen is that heaven doesn't cease to exist by any means. Because of all the people who have died and they literally lift up over the body. When their body turns to pure light, they move up. Not pure light to the human being in visual cortex, but sort of an energy being probably made up of energy that is untrackable by monitoring electron patterns or ethereal matter. 
but we go somewhere and it's because we are divorced from our our mortal coil, we lose all of the aches and pains that we might have in our body. Maybe a five-year-old who passes away doesn't, if they're not tortured, they simply go to sleep. And if they pass away in their sleep, they never really had any pain because their body was brand new. And it's just sort of a very comforting transition into dreamland. But for anyone over 40, we would notice, right? Get our eyesight back. <laughs> But now, what if God is in a battle? And I, you know, I'm not trying to suggest this is something you adopt necessarily. But he is fighting for you. It's romantic. It's very much like a movie. He's the hero. The devil's the anti-hero, the antagonist. Then every day, there might be something that we can do to empower our God. What is one of the most traditional archetypes between man and God in side stories? And this is sort of a way obscure question. That you, If you got the answer right, it would be amazing. When I wrote the film, Ku Colin, for Chris Simsworth, my story was that Northern and Eastern Ireland, Connacht and Ulster, were going at it. Uh, the annexed exiled former queen coming back to wreak havoc on her ex-husband, the king. And Lug was a god looking down on this world saying, oh my gosh, this is a bad one. And his wife is like, why is this a bad one? Can't you just gift them with reason? And he said, I can't do that because then they just become puppets. That's not what they're there for. It's not how we do it. And she says, well, just let them work it out. We fight on our realm. They fight on their realm. It's just the way it is. And he says, well, this one's bad because she's coming with a gigantic army and he's not ready. So I'm going to have to do something. And she says, you're too old to go down. Plus, you have to run our kingdom. And she's holding their brand new baby. And he looks at his wife and he says, sometimes the gods have to make sacrifices too. And she screams into the night, which is then overlaid with the virgin birth of Kukulin. The parable is, is that we have to believe in the gods, otherwise they don't exist. It could be, in some crude fashion, that we are all made of the same soul energy. And if we privilege loyalty to a particular being that has our best interests, slash just straight up common law, make it easy on your mind. That we empower God. We devote ourselves. Almost like in the movie Tron, where you send your power cycles to a program that makes them more powerful. They can do more things. They higher vibrations. Therefore, their army to fight the darkness. Bruce Campbell comes to mind. They have the ability to win. And what if it's just that simple? What if it's just that simple? If you cease believing in a God, and you can call him Jesus if you like, I support you either way. There's no one on earth who would probably love to meet that guy than me. And have him be real. Be great. I know his whole life story. But if you cease to believe, then that God gets deprecated. You pull the blood supply out of that God, and therefore... He, she, it cannot fight on your behalf. And because we know that the devil has a foothold in this world, and that's just a metaphor for some, and it could be a very literal thing for others, well, he just gets more powerful. Is it easier to build a house of cards or knock a house of cards down? Well, it's obviously to destroy things. It's a feeble mind that finds satisfaction in destruction. We watch NASCAR for the accidents. We watch Formula One for the accidents. Because there's something in us that has a fascination with destruction. How many have ever watched a war movie where it is actually the videos on the vehicles that are killing people on the ground? The A-10 Warthogs, the Apache helicopters, the Flying Fortresses. And we see what we believe to be the bad guys, the people who actually live there, 
we've come from 8,000 miles away and we are just liquefying these human beings. We see their bodies flying a bunch of pieces in these hot little pockets everywhere. And we're like, yes, this is awesome. Our side's winning. The bad guys are losing. Why do we believe that? Because somebody told us they're bad and we're good. Now, they're bad people? Well, sure. The more you piss people off, they're going to want to hurt you to defend themselves. And then we will be right in doing so. At one point in my life, I was very close to artificial intelligence programmers who were dealing with military in space. And they're putting things in space that can attack the ground, similar to war games. Okay. So there's AI in space that has the ability to potentially launch a missile from space down to Earth to avoid a war. And the artificial intelligence has been imbued, in some cases, with complete autonomy. It sits and thinks about war And it's objective all day long. And you know what the biggest struggle for those programmers were? If they wrote a line of code wrong, then that satellite could get to a point where it is thinking about this so much and it says, well, if I am supposed to stop a war and kill that particular enemy, and this is my home, I protect this, I kill those people, then maybe if I launch my missiles first, I can annihilate the enemy before they ever kill the planet, or our, sorry, our country, and therefore we win. Launch. And that was the biggest problem of creating Star Wars. Not the movie, but the array of satellites in space that was deployed in the late 80s. And then they told the world it wasn't deployed at all and it was canceled. Okay. It's the chicken and egg problem, right? And we know this exists all around the world. I utterly cannot explain the last four weeks of my life in terms of the awakening. Again, females, I mean, I don't know how I could ever say it on this show without you laughing at me that I'm going to say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, because I did not have this epiphany. This is just me simulating what I've experienced, but imagine me four weeks ago telling you folks, okay, here's what's going to happen, guys. All the women in America who are massive liberal Democrats, who hate your guts if you're center to right. If you believe in common law, they hate you. They're all going to see something and they're going to wake up. Now, they're not all waking up, but, you know, I mean, I don't talk to that many external females, right? It's all coming through like a few resources, someone's wife, uh, a girl's best friends, you know, that kind of thing. But they're waking up in droves. I love it. I can't even believe it. Q's barely doing anything and these people are still waking up. The information's out there. And they're brilliant people who are going after real resources. And the women seem to be more prone to do their research than men. So that's beautiful. I don't know if you know this, but when they were creating the the helmets for the Apache helicopter, the story I heard and was that they were trying to simulate, you know, use voices, computer control voices to tell the pilots, you know, you're flying too low, pull up, you know, this missile's being launched, this missile's armed, all those different messages they were getting from the computer. And apparently they attempted to do a male voice, thinking a male pilot would respond better to a male voice. And what they found, and I do not know how this worked, but they realized that a female voice had more power over the male. Maybe a maternal mother hen sort of thing. And now everything that you ever see is a woman telling you to pull up. Now, I definitely have played some uh, plane simulation games where it's still a guy. But in war, I've always heard a female voice. It's more powerful. It's interesting. I think in these bizarre times, I mean, what's what's a real bummer is that we've had a lot of tough years, right? And it's bizarre how our mind will look at a number 
and kind of feel a certain way about a number, right? 2019, eh, the only people that had a warm fuzzy about 2019 were those of us who liked the movie Blade Runner. I lost one of my best friends in the whole world in 2019, but he wasn't a young man. He lived a good life. But 2020, when it came around the corner, I think nearly all my friends who were of that level to register a number making them feel better. We all sat around. I mean, literally, we sat around at home in January and everybody said, I think this is going to be a really good year. Yeah, me too, man. It just feels right, right? Yeah, 2020. So it's a clean number. And then a group of people in the world decided to make it horrible. It's not the worst it could be, but they have robbed millions of business owners from their business utterly and completely gutted these businesses that will never, ever return. Children around the world aren't getting educated properly. They've now done studies to what, to figure out whether or not the kids even retained enough information to pass the previous grade. And now they truly believe that in fall of this year, 2020, we're going to have tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of children, absolutely ill-prepared for the next year. They didn't take the tests they were supposed to take. They didn't retain the information. Some of their parents are trying to scare them to death that they're going to die if they walk outside. We've now seen celebrities show their true colors. Celebrities that know all about child trafficking and aren't celebrating any of these people getting caught, which means they're involved one way or the other, by proxy or direct. We see celebrities that don't have two brain cells to rub together when it comes to analyzing science. But they're out there telling you how to live your life as if you need their opinion, as if you care about their opinion, as if they're going to come to your house and eat dinner with you if you do exactly what they say. It's interesting. If there's any truth to the fact that truth itself comes to man in many methodologies, then there seems to be this overwhelming desire for man to believe in a higher being. And not out of a servitude necessarily, although there's tens of millions, if not billions of people that take it to that level. Again, would you ever want your child to come back to your house every Sunday and worship you and just, you know, clean your feet, suck on your toes? No, you wouldn't. Like, go live your own life. Please come over to eat dinner. I'd love to ask you how your life is doing, but I'm here to support you. But you have to make your own decisions. You're your own person. Time to get hard. There's the sofa, right? There's your old bedroom. Okay. But worship is the need of a absolute childish narcissist. And I really doubt that's the way God would roll if God exists. But maybe the only thing God needs is to be believed in. To have power to align. Now, will evil ever cease to exist? Probably not. But can't we cling to the notion that if there was truly a God that is perfect and incapable of being in sin, and he maintains the universe, he being metaphorical, of course, then he couldn't have a backpack that he carries, which is our universe that's full of absolute horrors, beyond the wildest dreams of most modern mortal men and women. But the second you were to imagine that God's fighting a war, just like you fight a war, you're fighting for your income, you're fighting for your life. The mob rules is destroying the planet. And because we looked the other way, while television and the internet was making everybody stupid, While colleges cease to create degrees that are employable with any trade skills, we kept looking the other way, looking the other way the whole time. And it's all come to fruition. 2020 has taken everyone and beautifully exposed them like cockroaches in some cases, exposed them as absolutely mentally ill human beings, and really revealed a lot of the weaknesses within people. Someone walking around trying to tell someone how to be in public during this situation that we're in. Screaming and yelling at someone when they have taken opportunities to protect themselves with their own philosophy. Hmm. 
They revealed themselves to be petty-minded, low IQ, low vibration human beings that if they contribute to society at all, it would be only for their own gain, which is most likely based on greed, based on insecurities, to feed the reflection of their face in the water. But I'm willing to bet most of these people hate reflective surfaces. I just truly believe that. So when it comes to faith, from man to a God-like entity, any version of that, you're a Christian, you're a hardcore Christian, or you're just a human being who believes in a spiritual higher being, there's a sort of this in-game comfort that we get out of it. Well, at least after this, this uh, poop show that we're in is over. Hopefully it gets better before we all pass. But if it does truly go into the hands of these absolute psychopaths, at the end of it, at least we ascend to a place where there's no pain. Knowledge is abundant. Creativity is our very nature. Love is the only fabric of our universe once we go outside these confined ethereal walls. Maybe it is that way. But as Prince said, and let's go crazy, at the opening of his lyrics, he goes, but in this life, you're on your own. So we have to get in the purple elevator. That's what we have to do, right? Punch a higher floor. Now, just prior to this year, which gave abject morons the excuse to get in your face and try to interfere with your life, which is absolutely a pure violation of common law. They want to do you harm. They want to do you harm out of complete stupidity, and they want to do you harm if you don't follow their complete stupidity. Okay? But before that, we had what philosophy to get free of the craziness? You turn off your TV. You turn off the internet as it relates to television. The indoctrination tube that, uh, what is it, Uh, Frank Zappa, he's got that beautiful photograph where he's a toilet linked to a TV. Beautiful shot. I'll try to find it. It's been posted a couple of times on the Deep Thoughts Radio Facebook page. Brilliant. It said he was way ahead of its time, right? But last year, we could just disengage and then create a microcosm of intelligence surrounding ourselves with other Deep Thoughts listeners and other brilliant people. And we could kind of create a beautiful sort of... um Perhaps reality distortion field of pure positivity, creativity, and enlightenment. But now in 2020, the folks from the Agenda 21, who've had this plan the entire time, right? All of this stuff has been planned forever. And a friend of mine um, who just woke up, she collects trading cards of all kinds. And she is trying to track down the trading cards that were made in 1994 that are basically, it's called the Illuminati cards, and they predicted 9-11, that the World Trade Centers were on fire. Um, I forgot, she listed a whole litany of things, including the virus and a bunch of other stuff. So this is all planned, people. Not exactly how it happens, when it happens. Those are details that are sorted out the closer they get to the event, right? So we are sort of at a battle right now. There's a lot of folks intelligently saying, and this, I want you to understand, this has been said before. Back when the United States of America lost control of its money in 1913 with a a falsely ratified slash approved 16th Amendment, there were senators screaming and, and economists screaming at the United States citizens to say, do not pass that which is why they didn't, and which is why at least three or four states were held at gunpoint on Christmas Eve to pass it. And of course, then the Hearst Corporation started printing the press that we did approve it. Woodrow Wilson, which was a complete moron, sold us out, and Taft, the first Skull and Bones president, knew exactly what was happening. His buddy, Philander Knox, which is what Fort Knox is named after, despite any stories you're told, went around on a caboose and told the world that something great had happened. The people thought they were sticking it to the corporations and they got stabbed in the back. 
So we have been here before several times with all kinds of things where the demise of our country was being echoed right in your face. For those of you who remember the election of 1992, where Bill Clinton snuck into the White House with a minority vote, meaning he got the least amount of votes, Ross Perot gave it to Bill Clinton. But he was telling you that NAFTA was the worst thing that ever happened. Of course, Ross screwed up by running and then pulling out and then running again. I mean, what an idiot. But he was telling you NAFTA was going to kill America. And then he said the sucking sound is going to suck all the jobs out of America. And what happened? Three decades later, our current president's going, yeah, that's why I canceled it. That's why TPP got canceled. Look at what happened to all of your jobs. Ross Perot told you, but everyone ignored him because they're abject morons. And this is about to happen in 2020 if we don't get control over virtually every aspect of our respective countries. Kanye West said something on TMZ, because he recently did his presidential um, announcement, which was a train wreck of all train wrecks. But he said something that is very offensive if you take it a particular way, but if you try to get behind what he was saying, it echoes to what's going on now. Let me give an example. They were talking about slavery. And again, he's in a privileged state of being a multi-multi-millionaire. According to him, he's a billionaire, but no one seems to know it in the financial districts. But we'll let him live in the world that he's in. But he said, you know, slavery went on for 400 years in America. And he goes, 400 years? He goes, it sure, sure sounds like a choice to me. And what is he saying? People are like, what are you talking about? Bruh, bruh, bruh. And what he's saying is, why didn't you all rise up, grab your picks and your shovels, and go kill the plantation owners one at a time? Just kill them all. Just boom, 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 boom. What are they going to do? You got 100 guys on a field. You kill anybody who's watching you. Then you kill everybody who's in the house. Then you just move to the next house. Then you get another 100 guys. Now you have 200, then 300. And if you just never stop, you're just going to waste them all. That's what he was saying. But of course, he said it on TMZ, which is uh, probably the epicenter of mental illness on planet Earth. But now, I watch videos. This is happening in America, but it's a little more difficult to put together in America, except for the family in Missouri, I believe it was, that defended their home with guns and they had their guns confiscated. Now they're being charged for their constitutional rights and our president just sits on the sidelines going, well, whatever. But in England, for the last, geez, at least 10 years of YouTube, we are seeing police officers come to residents and harass residents against their rights of free speech. And somehow I've got friends of mine who are brilliant British people and they're sitting there telling me I can't understand it. And most of these people do resist at the door. But their government, which has a group of people that cannot be charged with anything, right? Prince Andrew technically cannot be charged in his country for any crime. That's just the law. And every single country that has the queen's face on their money, come on. Doesn't that seem a little strange? Canada and Australia, maybe New Zealand. I don't know New Zealand's money, but I'm sure it does. I think Hong Kong still has some or her face on the money. Maybe not anymore, but it did. Prince Andrew was uh, sleeping with underage girls over and over and over again. He's never going to get charged. It can't be charged unless the thing changes. All right. Well, what if he did some other super duper horrible stuff? You still can't charge him. He could do it on TV, just like the first episode of Black Mirror. Instead of a pig, could have been a kid. You can't do anything because you've allowed your country to have that situation. Now, in America, we do forbid charges to be pushed against the acting president, but we can arrest that dude the second he gets out of office. Okay. And technically speaking, in America, um, we'd probably lynch anybody who did anything horrific in front of us, right? But so the police of Scotland Yard, I guess, that's what it is. They are out of control in, in England. You have no more rights. 
you're living in the first stages of a totalitarian return because England, as far as I know, had the most sophisticated society on planet Earth, say 500 years ago, but also had the most intense multi-layered tyranny of anywhere on Earth ever. Meaning, yes, there was more draconian things happening in different places on Earth in previous time sets. But imagine this, you're super intelligent as a race, as a people, right? All different cultures, but you're super sophisticated and you still couldn't say a stamp tax was a bad thing. So a bunch of people fled over here to America, set the joint up, put a bunch of stuff in place, and we're jerks for having those rights. Everywhere on planet Earth, the guns have been taken away. Tyranny returns. England being one of them. Okay. And they want to come over and take the guns from America. Last place on Earth. With a super sophisticated society, high vibration people, want to take it away. So, boom, it's gone. Now, returning back to the celestial realm of consciousness... I think we are on our own, 100%. But just like the story of Zeus, or the story of Lug from Kukulin, isn't it interesting that when you pray to a god, I mean genuinely so, results typically happen. It's a wild thing. Maybe it's a direct relationship that we have with our God. He's actually listening. He's like, I got a red phone for you, but if you don't call it, I don't do anything. Just my policy. Because you calling means that you acknowledge me, thus you have faith in me, thus you empower me with your loyalty. It's not that I'm trying to control you or manipulate you. It's just the way the universe is hooked up. Maybe God even inherited the fabric of his world. Just the way it is. I didn't decide to make it that way. But it could be simply law of attraction or manifest destiny, another built-in power of human consciousness. The more elevated you are as a human being, the more your tentacles of thought and decisive decision-making towards a particular goal gives you that goal. I told you guys a long time ago, a friend of mine needed $10,000. Maybe it was a thousand bucks, can't remember. But I said to her, I said, look, just the fact, because she's sweating over it, and I said, look, just the fact that you can conceive that you need the money cuts the difficulty in half, because if you didn't know you needed it, but you needed it, you'd never get it, and whatever slings and arrows is result in having that money, it's going to hit you in the face. So now you know. Now you can hustle. So maybe you don't get all the money, but whatever money you're able to get in a short period of time is enough to satiate your debtor. Maybe they'll leave you alone. I think that might be the way the universe works for us. There's the old adage that what you put out is what you give back. Well, part of that's just a benign statement to say, I put positivity out, I get positivity back. But what if it's a well-crafted goal becomes manifest? I know that most of you, if not every single one of you, do this anyway. All I'm doing is sort of adding a little context at best to the arguments within our mind that might inhibit our ability to believe that these commitments and these acts actually work. I want you to believe in yourself and your ability to do something and not sort of like that little pep talk thing that might last a split second then I leave the room and then you go back to your doubting. Enlightenment is very difficult to reverse. A friend of mine said an absolutely brilliant thing the other day, and this is something I encourage all of you to say to yourself and to other people. She said, I don't know a single person that has been red-pilled who turned back to the blue pill. Like the dude in Matrix who wanted to go back. Never seen it before. Because typically the red pill involves you seeing things that cannot be unseen. And that is the purest definition of enlightenment. And you are enlightened. You are. Or you wouldn't last this long on this show. And you certainly wouldn't be a regular listener. Understand that you can design your life. 
I had a friend of mine uh, I talked to today, and he sort of has an interesting sort of, um, I guess, uh, self-deprecating personality. And he's very much aware of it. He was communicating to me that as he gets older, he thinks he, he, he essentially goes back to his past and he compounds the impact of the negative things that he experienced. So to put that in an easier term, if he thought that a mistake he made in 1990 was a, was a four, Today in 2020, he'll upgrade the four to a six, and then perhaps 2021, he'll make the six an eight. So it just seems like it's an overwhelming, oh my gosh, what have I done with my life sort of perspective. And of course, we talk, and I do what I do, and I played a reflection session to him, and then I started putting my own DNA in there a little bit, because we're, we're within about five years of each other's age. He's a little bit older than me. But I just kept telling him, I said, well, that thing I've experienced too. And you know what? It wasn't my fault and it's not your fault. It just happened. He tried to lean back on the fact that it was something that he did that made something occur. And I kept arguing with him without arguing necessarily. But I said, well, I don't think that's the case, man. I mean, what about this? What about that? Did you have control of that? Well, there's other things I could have done. So I said, well, so what you're trying to do is live an absolutely perfect life where you have no regrets. Well, you'd be the rarest human being on planet Earth if that was the case. And finally, he stood up. And he had to go get something. And he's like, you know, he goes, I'm sorry I'm in this mood. And he goes, yeah, he goes, you know, I just, you know, he needed a vent. He needed to say those words so that he could hear them and make sure that he agreed with them. And I think in the end, I don't think he agreed with much of what he was saying, but he needed to vent that. Because that was a little loopy negative frequency inside of his chest. The one thing that I have found about the belief in a God is that I do have the sense, almost like a sixth sense, that there is a God. And I think most of us have gone through that. Even if you return back to atheism, you've considered it at least, right? For those of you who are very devout to that belief system. And, you know, again, it could be purely scientific for those of you who are Atheists, it could just simply be the central computing force of, of the universe itself, the mathematics that holds the universe together. But what I have found is when I concentrate on that force, regardless if I'm asking for something in return, for my time spent speaking to that being, or just saying thanks, there's like a coolness that comes over my being doesn't mean all of a sudden everything gets fixed. But it's like my friend, if she didn't conceive of needing the money, she was never going to get it. And maybe if we don't conceive of what we need to change, or what should change in this universe, it's never going to happen. How could it? It'd be just like some weird miracle where everything just went click and everyone woke up the next day and was different. Wouldn't that be a cool movie? One person... One person didn't click. One cynical person was left over looking at the universe and going, how are you guys all happy? I'm not happy. Sort of like that uh, Twilight Zone about mind over matter. The thread came out of the sweater and I had to pull it before the uh, final episode. I'm just going to keep doing these things, man. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. And please visit deepthoughtsradio.com. We have two major arteries for video, YouTube and BitChute. BitChute's working pretty great. Sometimes it takes like three days to encode a video. We have all the audio you could possibly want from Google to Apple to whatever generic device you have. You can get it right off the website. We have five social media now. I would say the most important two would be our locked Facebook group. And it is locked so that when you post your private thoughts, it's locked away from anyone else that could critique you within your circle. So, you know, people can look up your activity on Facebook and the, the, your activity on this show's page won't show up. So you have your own private protected thing. And this is the greatest group of people ever. I mean, we had a giant group of people January 1st, 2020. 
But I also had a giant group of friends in Los Angeles in January 1st, 2020. And what's the difference in July of 2020? A lot of my friends in real life have turned into complete blankety blanks. And the people on Facebook have kept it so cool. And it's just like a great oasis to be in. So if you're not a part of that Facebook group and you do have a Facebook account, you definitely want to get up there and click the link. The other one, I do Twitter. I'm tweeting more. So if you guys are into that, which I kind of loathe the platform, but I kind of get in there just because you have to put your skin in the game. The other one is minds.com, which is a brand new Facebook competitor. There's gab.com. It's a Facebook competitor, but it's really behind the times. And then there's parlor, which is just a really bizarre thing. It's very inconsistent in its behavior. I'll, I paste usually a video URL and it gives you a, a preview down below. This last two videos, it's just the URL. Nothing I can do to make it sexy. Very sad. So minds.com has got its act together and I think it's gorgeous. It's can't, it can't customize it a whole bunch, but it's really cool. There are two ways to donate to the page. And um, in these intense times, I can't even believe it, but you guys have pushed the Patreon over a hundred bucks. So super appreciate that. It does help, man. It does help. So I just super appreciate that. And there's also PayPal, which I think you have the choice of making it anonymous. So if you want to just completely hide but contribute to the show, that's another way. We also have a store with shirts. And again, I'm working on some new ones. I just got a really good idea yesterday for a shirt. Finally got this uh, thing put together. I wanted to create a funny shirt that would be cool for the show brand. So that'll be coming out in the next month or so. Uh, we also have a remastered season one because of music issues and copyright issues. A bunch of videos were not visible on this particular channel. So instead of uploading a hundred new remastered episodes and weird sequences, screwing up all the numbers, I pushed it off to its own channel. Both are demonetized. One was never monetized. This was demonetized. And I want to say the episode that got us demonetized that you might want to pass around with the adage that it was demonetized. This video was so hot that it demonetized the entire channel it was episode 498. If that ever gets pulled off and I can't believe they didn't kill it, it's going to be on bit shoot, obviously. So anything that gets killed that we want to keep, um, I'll change the website to reflect that. The website has every episode on there that we haven't retired, which is very few. But I did get rid of all the Corona stuff because it's just all late, inaccurate information, speculation, so, anywho, thanks for joining the show. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I will see you on the next Deep Thoughts. Over now.